life shall be changed forever. The theme of the conference is the power of God's mercy. Now my question is, how do you attract the mercy or the help of God? And as I pondered upon this topic, I could not help but think about the Jews. If you want a title for this message, it's called The Power of Invisible Wealth. I could not help but think about the Jews. And when you look at the Jews as, as a group of people, I'm talking about historically now, not just the Bible. Yeah, they, are, they typify the mercy of God. They typify the hand of God. I'm going to ask you a quiz, a, a question right now, and, and tell me what, what you think the commonality is between these people. Max Zuckerberg, Larry Page, Bloomberg, Spielberg, Abramovich of Chelsea. I know this is Liverpool territory, so I'll be very careful what I say. <laughs> okay? And then George Soros. What do you think the commonality is? They are, they are Jews and they are all very wealthy. And you see, and the list is endless. I mean, I have a list of others, but for sake of time, we'll leave it at this. And you see, when you look at the Jews, you will find that there is something about them that regardless of where they go to, they prosper. In fact, this is usually the bane of the persecution they face in the countries that they, they, they live in. Because and if I don't know if they have Jews. I hear they have Jews in... I hear the Igbos are Jews. Something to that effect. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anywhere they go, they do what? They prosper. I believe there's somebody here that you will carry something that anywhere you go to, you will prosper. Yeah. But listen to this. I want you to understand that, you know, there was something that, that distinguishes the Jews. What is it that made them prosper or makes them to prosper? I'm talking about from, from, you know, days past. We're talking about in Austria, in Germany, what actually incensed Hitler and made them to start killing the Jews because they said they were taking all their jobs and all their wealth. But listen to this. Nobody can stop your wealth because it is not wealth that can be touched. The Jews are so profound in the kind of wealth that they had that when, after they've made, made money everywhere else, they now, I think it was in the 1940s or, or some, somewhere around there, decided to um, go back to Israel, to Palestine. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that they had to move very quickly. So they did not actually take a lot of their physical possessions with them. You know what? Most of them just escaped with their lives and went to the land. And guess what? They eventually became one of the most prosperous nations in the world. And that means, listen to this, they, they, they boarded planes or whatever it was without carrying gold, without carrying money. But when they arrived at that place, what happened is that they began to flourish again. There are some people in this world, it doesn't matter what you take from them. Put them in the desert, they will flourish. I believe I'm talking to you about 50 of those people here. Yeah. Listen to this. The Jews are not just prosperous in financial wealth. They also have something called, I mean, their army is the, one of the strongest in the world, even though there are very few. Their intelligence service is, is the Mossad is, is, is one of the most astute in the world. Why? And when I look at this, it cannot be human intelligence. It cannot be. They must have a, a certain kind of backing. And I believe that that backing is the backing of God. Now, listen to this. If the Jews left Austria, they left Switzerland, left Poland, and then they, they got onto planes and they moved to the Palestine without money in their pocket, what did they carry? Let's begin to think and ponder. The other day I was passing through an airport. Don't do this at home, please. Don't try it. And... You know, um, as I got to, you know, where they search you and you go through, you know, you empty your pockets and all of that. The guy asked me, he says, do you have any sharp objects on you? I paused and I did like this. I said, yes, you step back. He said, where? I did like this. <laughs> he laughed and he said, don't try, don't do that again. <laughs> And make sure you don't do it in New York. If at all, you're going to do it at all. Yeah. Now, 
the, yes, there's something about intellectual prowess and intellectual pro, uh, property, but I believe that the Jews had a lot more than that. I believe they have what you call spiritual wealth. Listen to this. Can you imagine a set of people coming into Palestine? It's desert land. And then they turn that place into one of the most flourishing agricultural lands in the whole world. So that the whole world, the best oranges in the world are from, from, from Israel. Jaffa oranges. There's somebody here that it felt like they left you with nothing. After this, after this conference, the hand and the mercy of God will bring you out of that nothing and move you into something big. Oh, that amen is too weak. And you see, to fully understand it, we need to, to begin to look at certain things. And we'll look at the life of David, then eventually Abraham. Second Samuel chapter, chapter 9 verse 1 to 4 says, Now David said, Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul? That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Wow. This scripture here is so powerful and laden. You know, it will, I, I don't have enough time and bandwidth to explain it all, but I will do my best so that it can help give support or credence to what we're talking about. And then somebody responded and said, And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? Now, that is even more surprising. David wakes up one morning. This is the king of the whole of Israel. And he begins to ask, is there anybody left from, from the house of Saul? Saul, who was his enemy. And Saul, who tried to kill him. Yeah. And then he said, that I may bless him or show him kindness. The word kindness there is the same root from which we get the word mercy. That I may show him mercy or show him compassion. But then he says, but this compassion is not just because I, I, I want to be kind to anybody. He says, but for the sake of Jonathan. This is what you call the covenant of mercy. Why was, Jonathan, why was David looking for somebody from the house of Saul? And why did he want to bless him for Jonathan's sake? Because he, made a, a, he cut a covenant with Jonathan before he died. That when he gets on the throne, now listen to this, that no matter what happened, he was going to be kind or merciful to Jonathan's children. Now, Jonathan's children did not know anything about this. In fact, this guy, the one that was left called Mephibosheth, was down and out, forgotten, downtrodden, and broken. He was lame in his feet. Listen to this. I believe there are people under the sound of my voice who don't know this. That God is looking for somebody here. God is looking for somebody online whom he will show kindness for Jesus' sake. Yes. Uh, you're not understanding what I'm saying. <laughs> and he's desperately looking. Who is there anybody who, who I can show mercy or kindness for Jesus' sake? Then the guy says, but, but, but I don't qualify. Why? I have issues. I am lame in my feet. He says, your, your issues cannot stop the mercy of God. I, this is bigger than you. This is the deal I had. It's not even a deal. A covenant I had with, with, with your father or, you know, beforehand that is that you when you were not in the picture i made it so it's about him they took that boy he was a beggar in lodiba and they took him and they brought him to the king's table there is somebody here who they are going to take you from obscurity this year and move you into notoriety because of the mercy of god ah uh, this is not even my message you see david helped uh, uh, um, Mephibosheth because of Jonathan now you know when we talk about the sure mercies of David if you look at David's life God responded to David the way he treated other men David was merciful to Saul he had the opportunity to kill and destroy Saul on a number of occasions to talk against Saul he didn't do so you know what God covered David as well. The same way David kept covenant 
in helping to bring Mephibosheth up. God kept covenant with David and gave him an everlasting covenant. If you look at Psalm 89, you can put it up on the screen, verse 19. You will see there and verse 24 that he says he found a, found a mighty one and helped him. I see God finding you and helping you. Yeah. He exalted him. And he said, so, so that his enemy would not be able to outwit him or exact their influence upon him. Serious, I mean, these are some serious scriptures that we can't even go into because they will take us in another direction. What makes a God cut a covenant with a man that, that is lasting from one generation to the next? That's the question. But to, for me today, what I'm talking to you about is not about mercy for this year. Tell somebody next to say, they say that's too small. I'm not talking about mercy for the next five years. I'm talking about mercy that will last from generation to generation. Can I talk to you, somebody? So the question is, how do you build generational wealth and blessings? Okay, you build it by with invisible wealth. What is invisible wealth? I can hear you ask that question. Exodus chapter three, verse six. He says, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his faith. Where is the invisible wealth? And what is it? The invisible wealth is God himself. You didn't get that. The question is, what will your children inherit from you? My father passed on earlier this year. God bless, you know, him. And um, at the age of 87. And when my dad was alive, he used to tell us, and I thought it was a joke. He said to us, he said, none of you should wait for any money, house, property. Say, I will spend it all before, in front of you. <laughs> we thought he was joking. He says, what I owe you is a good education. That's really what I, I, I'm going to give to you. And he actually gave us that. But listen to this. You cannot survive. Some of you already know in this world, especially in Nigeria, with just a good education. You need more than that. So, now, sadly, a lot of us, our focus is on money. Can I have my, uh, my helpers? I, I want four people, please. Yes, can I have four people? And I will show you what invisible wealth is. Okay, so four gentlemen, can you please yes, stand in order? Let me, let, where's, who's the smallest one? Which one of them? That's the one that will receive the mercy of God. Come. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so I have some British pounds here, 50 pounds each. Okay. All right. So this is what he says in this scripture concerning Abraham. I want to show you something about invisible wealth transfer. Okay. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 25, verse 5 to 6, it says, And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac, his son. To the country of the east so let's say these are four of abraham's sons and i, I, I wish i had more but uh, uh, this is what i have here okay so let's say this 50 pounds is 50 million dollars each abraham was a very wealthy man and so he gave him what? give me my money back huh? <laughs> <laughs> give one to ishmael Gave one to somebody else. And Isaac was expecting his own. He didn't give him anything. <laughs> Is that fair? Come, come forward. What he gave Isaac was more than that. He gave him all that he had. He gave him all that he had. These guys walk away thinking they are very rich. 50 million. 50 million will end someday. 
But when Isaac wears this coat, anywhere he goes, they know Abraham and they know his coat. And all the relationships that he had with the, um, with, the, with Abimelech, with Pharaoh, and he can tap into 100, 200 million dollars because of the relationship he had with those, I mean, I mean, with those people. Now, what am I trying to say? You can go back to your seats very quickly. Uh, but give me my money back. Thank you. <laughs> God bless you. Yes. The Lord be with you. <laughs> give me my money back. Thanks, spiritual blessing. <laughs> go and make your own. <laughs> now, li listen to this very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Bible says something and it mentions it very specifically it says he gave all that he had what do you mean all that he had he just gave those guys money he just gave Ishmael and the other people possessions, camels and all that and then the Bible says no he gave Isaac all that he had which means the real wealth was what he gave Isaac because that the invisible wealth is what produces all the other things. Then we see something after that, that that same pattern is followed from one generation to the other. We see concerning Isaac, it says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 20, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. We know the story that before he died, he says, I want to give you all that I have. And it was in his hands. Esau was not discerning. Esau was, was concerned about material things. And right before his face, Jacob took all that he had. Jacob did the same thing. In Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21, he says, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons. He refused to die before he transferred this invisible wealth. Because he was aware that that is what is going to make Mark Zuckerberg Mark Zuckerberg. And that he will need it in the 2020s. And then he says, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Just before he died, he blessed them. He made sure there was an invisible wealth transfer. I want to say to you, like Esau, please don't forfeit your invisible spiritual wealth for material temporal blessings. Esau was looking at the 50 million dollars. If Esau was just concerned when he came to Wavbeck about how he will feed his stomach, how he will break through financially, listen to this. The most important thing is to receive the invisible coat of God's presence. I want to very quickly share with you four benefits of invisible wealth. And if I have the time, I will, I will show you very quickly how to cultivate that wealth. The first benefit of invisible wealth is the presence of God himself. <laughs> the Lord told Abraham, you know, when Abraham asked him in Genesis 15, he said, Lord, what will you do for me seeing that I go childless? And he said, Abraham, don't you get it? I am your shield and your increasingly great, re great reward. <laughs> Which means that, look, I, I, you, I am everything that you need. You have me, don't be concerned. You will have more than children. Now listen to this. When I talk about the presence of God, it says in Luke chapter 3 verse 22, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see here, now listen to this, where in Genesis 25, a physical quote was given in quote, to Isaac, and I will show you what that what that what that coat did for him. A spiritual coat was released from heaven to God's own son. I don't think you got it. The heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit came down on him. The Bible talks about he was they were endued with power, which means he put a coat on him. You see, in the Greek, it's called toga virilis. It was actually a, a quote that they gave to the son of a man, of a father, that wherever he went to, he can speak on his behalf. And when the quote came upon, upon Jesus, we see something happen. 
the heavens opened and he began to hear God's voice. This is the first place I see in record that we hear that God speaks to the earthly Jesus. Am I, is, this, is that true or not? It says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What does that mean? When you start wearing the invisible coat of God, you will start hearing his voice. Let me tell you a few stories or testimonies. It just so happened, and Pastor, I, I, I wasn't sure whether to share this story or not, but Pastor Paju mentioned something again just before he introduced me, and I thought, this, that's my cue. Bishop Francis Wally O.K. is a phenomenal man. And I will leave it at that for tonight. I don't have the time to tell you a few stories. I have about three or four stories that he doesn't even know ever happened. Long story short, he holds this conference and has held it for, for years called the Holy Ghost Convention, I believe. Yeah? Something to that effect. Okay? Um, I grew up in Ibado, as in, uh, I mean, Pastor Paul, you grew up there as well. I went to medical school there. And that was where I gave my life to Jesus. And they had this conference. And that was the very first Christian conference I ever att attended. And so, I was, I, I don't have the time to explain how I got there. I didn't know anybody. I was very new to the Christian faith. But I got there. And while I was at the conference, I now saw Archbishop Idahosa had been hearing about for many years for the first time. And so many other people. I wasn't as excited as you were because, remember, I'm coming from the world. And all I had heard was negatives. And I saw him in this is flowing down. And I said, you see them? And to add this sort of an injury, and when he came up, he raised an offering. I said, you see? This is what I'm talking about. And he began to talk about giving to the convention and that people should sow a seed. That and I was just there, just being like this. Like, look, say your own thing. I just be going. Come on, be going. And then while he was talking, I just bowed my head. As I bowed my I saw a vision. And the Lord told me, give. Ah, to this man. <laughs> so they can buy more Agbada with us. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then I said, well, it doesn't help me. I don't have any money on me. So what did I do? I made a pledge and I put it on a piece of paper. And I put it in the basket. I've given. And I put a thousand naira. A thousand naira in the, the it was equivalent. I mean, that's about a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds. And I will tell you why I, I say it is. And I forgot about it. It was like two months I forgot about. It. One day, I was in the bathroom at Alexander Brown Hall, brushing my teeth. When I heard in my right ear, that money you promised, go and give it. I, I said, which money? <laughs> He <laughs> said, that money that you promised, go and give. I said, well, no, I, I, I pledge some. And then, it's that money to that man. And I said, go and give it. Very clear. I looked around and I said, oh, get the behind me. He said, the, the, the next thing, I, I said, I don't have any money. He said, you have. You have from where? The money you just collected for two months for your pocket money. 500 naira each month. I said, that's all I have. He said, you have to give it. That money, I put it inside my jacket pocket in my room. So that I will not give that money, I took 100 naira and spent it immediately. So that it will not be complete. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You are laughing at yourself. You've done it before. <laughs> My friend, who I just led to the Lord three months earlier, came visiting, didn't say anything to me. I thought he was fighting with me. He just walked straight into my room as he opened the door and he just pointed at where the jacket is. He says, give unto the Lord what is the Lord. I said, are you using something? <laughs> anyway, to cut the long story short, I took that money I don't know that. I don't think Bishop Waleoke will ever know. He went to him personally and gave it to him. 
I was expecting my hundredfold. <laughs> it was very slow to come. Throughout that two month period, listen to this, I fasted throughout. And when I wanted to break, I would visit some friends' rooms when, they about, when I smelled them cooking. That's how I survived that period. To cut a long story short, let's fast forward a little. I graduated from medical school and I started earning a salary of 2,500 naira a month. Long story short, again, I began to see movement of my colleagues. You know, it was, it was, it was uh, you know, the, the usual. They went abroad to go and study um, and, and continue their whatever. And then the Lord spoke to me through Genesis 26. He says, there's a famine in the land and Isaac was about to go to Abimelech in Ghana, and the Lord said, do not go down to Egypt. God told me, do not go to London. Stay here. I will prosper you. Long story short, he also told me, I started a t-shirt business. I left Mercy, started a t-shirt business. The, the business I started was with one t-shirt. I made one t-shirt, 250 naira. That's what I started with. And then I went, I used to, I went to a bar to go and get fabric and then make, and started making t-shirts and selling them. My first, from my first trip, yeah, the income I made for my salary from that business was 25,000 naira every month. Ten times what my doctor's salary. Doctor, 2,500 naira was like 2,500 pounds a month. Within three months of starting that business, I made 100,000 naira. I bought a Mercedes-Benz car. To cut a long story short, before I traveled to England, yeah, I had a contract. I was doing businesses for Guarantee Trust Bank, Texaco, you know, Swedish companies. I got a, 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 a contract from a Swedish company for about $1.3 million before I left. Somebody say invisible wealth. Because I heard, I was wearing a coat and I heard a voice. I mean, time will not permit me, permit me but I will, I will just give one or two other examples. And this thing, listen to this, you know, God told me that, look, you can, people say you can never be poor. You can never be poor. This one is beyond poverty for me. What God was saying that you have done something that has stirred up the mercies of David. And that anywhere you go, you wear a coat that you will hear his voice. And listen to this. So I live in England now. And then, you know, uh, I have two sons, two, two wonderful sons. And my son was getting to 12, 13 there about. And very interesting. These are my boys are very interesting. But he now began to research schools. In England, there are very many free schools that are very good. The one that this boy went to recite is one of the most expensive schools in, in, in the whole of England. Every day I would see him on YouTube watching him. I'm like, hey, what are you watching? He said, I said, look, my, my guy, leave all that one. My wife would just say, let's humor him, leave him, don't discourage him. Anyway, one day, my wife wakes me up. We just had a video. He said, it is time to go and view uh, uh, the school Tony. I said, what school? He said, that school... I said, the school that we don't want him to go to. He said, let's just humor him. He said, just, you know, you don't want to discourage. Anyway, long story short, you know, I go reluctantly because I'd only slept for two hours. And when they were taking us through the school, yeah, you know, like I was doing, my wife was going in front with them. I was behind, feeling sleepy. <laughs> and just bored and annoyed. So when they were taking them around, all of a sudden, we got entered into one room. And as we entered that room, I looked at her, I said, I've been here before. But I've never been here before. I then realized I had a dream the last night. And in that dream, I saw this hall. This exact same hall. And I was standing, and then, I, as the man was talking, he was saying, yes, I, um, apart from eating, yeah, that, you know, uh, uh, has had 12, 20 of Britain's um, 20 prime ministers went through eating. This is the next school. Seven of the prime ministers of the United Kingdom went, uh, I mean, generally went through that school. I said, Well, I'm not looking for prime minister at school. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, 
this same hall that we are sitting in or standing in is where Winston Churchill went to the school. Say so this same hall, Winston Churchill used to speak here, the speech room. As I was going out, the Lord said, I showed you that place to sit there. You are sending this boy to this school. I said, have you seen my account, Lord? <laughs> to call a long story short, I clearly didn't have the money, but I had an invisible, invisible coat. Because a month later, somebody calls me from another nation. I was in Nigeria. Said, do you know uh, somebody who saw me, saw me, uh, oil? But he said, you know, I didn't even hear what he said. I said, don't worry, I will know. I... <laughs> long, I called, some, anyway, long story, long story, long story short. That's how we sent the boy to the school. And his young people now, we will deprive him. So that's how we said. And you know what? That's how God paid the, 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 the school fees. Eh? It's more than my wife's salary. Almost as much as my salary for a year. Just three weeks ago, so after he graduated from the school, I'll tell you in a short while, he, he, he got admission into Cambridge. I'm saying all of this not you understand to show you about the help and the mercies of God and my boys not the first one got to have two sons admission into Cambridge the second one got into Oxford because of the mercies of God because of a coat because the two boys will tell you that I, I know I'm not that intelligent he went for one uh, uh, um, school interview he didn't read anything me, yeah, I know. Because he was playing game the day before. And I was warning him. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I'm really Nigerian, even though I live in England. <laughs> and this is how... <laughs> oh my God, finish this person. This is... <laughs> this, so he went to the place. He went to the to whatever. And, you know, I said, this boy. Okay. He went there and they were asking him some questions. When he came out, I said, how did he do? He said, that it was phenomenal. I said, what do you... He said, they asked him some questions about the economy, this and that. And he just heard something on Sky News that I was listening to yesterday, and he just repeated it. <laughs> and that the teacher said, oh, do you know about so-so and so economic theory? He said, no. He said, that's what you just spoke about. They gave him a scholarship. The boy that was playing game yesterday. <laughs> the, the younger brother, when he went to Oxford for the interview, when he came, I said, Dad, I, I'm sorry, I messed it up. I messed it up. I messed it up. The result came out. They took him. The sure mercies of David. Now, what actually perplexed me more in all of this is that when my older son got to his final year in Cambridge, he was, uh, um, it was do during lockdown. And then he said he went on a walk. And while he was going on the walk, a prayer walk, he began to speak to God. He said, God, I want a first class. If, I give, if you give me this first class, it shall be to your glory. It shall be for this, it shall be for that. And then he said, the Lord gave him a word. These are the boys. These, these boys, I'm telling you, that, you know, you, you have children too now, ain't it? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and then the Lord gave him a word. Uh -huh. And so he came back home and told me, he said, Dad, I had an experience. I said, I said, what was that? He told me. And he said, God gave me this word. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse. Do you know that same morning when I woke up, that's exactly the same word God gave to me. And told me that when I gave my life, when I was his age, that was the first scripture God gave to me. And that morning while he was in the world, God was speaking to me as well and said, I'm about to transfer what you have to your son. What 
I'm saying is, listen to this. This wealth is transferable. The boy came out with a first class from Cambridge. The kind of favor, uh, I don't know. Look, not only did he come out, he came out, he started a fintech company. He's 23. Now, he just turned 23. Yeah, and he, he raised the kind of things that this, my two boys are doing. I'm telling you, even I myself, the, both of them have more influence than I do that in my whole lifetime. I am not joking. When, when my first son was 19, when he just got into Cambridge, he was interviewed by Sky News, BBC World News. Not once, not twice. The, the vice chancellor of Cambridge selected him alone to put him on a board. Out of all the students. <sighs> I'm trying to finish this message. While this boy was running this fintech company, I was here in Lagos with him. He was somewhere else in a flat running business with his, his, his friends. I was somewhere else praying and I had a dream. And I, I saw a Jewish name in the dream. Something like Yakal. And I was wondering what does that was that. My son comes to the house later where I am and says, Daddy, I've been looking for you. Yeah, you know, I'm about to start a, a, a something fund. You know, I don't, I don't know what they call this. Capital, some blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for a Jewish name. What do you think about the name Gadal? <laughs> I said, that is the name. By the sure message of David. You, and do you know why the name, choosing the name was important to him? Because when he was 17, he opened a fund. He, he set up a company and gave it a name, something capital, Kairos Capital. He got a letter from a lawyer from Europe, a, a, a massive multi-billion euro company threatening to sue him. For that name. He read to me that. <laughs> I said, they've never sent me, the, even my local government hasn't sent me this kind of letter. <laughs> I said, I said, don't be afraid. He just he said, when Goliath is threatening, it means you are a David. <laughs> that if a, if 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 a company with multi-billion uh, euro fund can be threatened, and they, was, they were afraid because he had that name. But I said, let it go. Why? Because God will give you your own Rehoboth. The second thing that invisible wealth does is that it gives you perception. And when I say perception, I'm talking more about, um, because I'm trying to use acronyms of P to make, it, to make it easier for us to remember. When you have the invisible quote, it attracts help from people and from angels. Both terrestrial and celestial help. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Somebody say to you, say, when you wear the coat, when you wear the coat, people will perceive the grace of God on you. It's an invisible quote. You will not know why they just... Uh, look, I said, of all the students, it's him they picked to go on Sky News. Of all the students, it's him that the vice president... You, you've heard about all these reparations of slavery and all of that. Yeah, he was on that board. Of all the students, it's him they picked. Why? Because, and they, they're not Christians though. They just say, this one has grace. Why? Because his father gave him an invisible coat. What will you give to your children? You see, also that coat will make angels recognize you. <laughs> you see, angels have to be given a cue to know who they will help. It is the people that wear the coat. 
It says in Genesis 24 verse 7, it says, The Lord God of heaven, who took me from the father's house, my father's house, and from the land of my family, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son from there. Listen to this. Isaac could not choose a wife for himself. So, he needed the help of an angel. I will not, I don't have time to talk about this. But, okay, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have time to talk about this. But listen to this. How did I get married to my wife? My mother died when I was seven years old. So in the choice, looking for a wife, I couldn't actually find... A, they say when a man chooses a wife, he looks for his mother and the wife. I didn't have a mother. To cut a long story short, I mean, I went... You know, anyway, long story short... The day I met my wife, it was her pastor that introduced us. We were going out. I, was, I just wanted to just honor the pastor. I just, ah, in this day and age, is it by introduction you will marry? You, you know what I mean? We were having lunch when I just suddenly said, hold on, by the name, what's your, what is your middle name? She said, yes. Her name is Bimbo. Okay. So I know her dad is Christian and her mom was Muslim. So I said, okay, they must have given her a Muslim name. You know what I mean? So I said, is your name Shakira? She said, no. I said, is it Kudira? She said, no. I said, is it Kubura? She said, no. I said, then it must be Kili Rat. <laughs> and while she was laughing, I had a word of knowledge. And I said, your name is Rebecca. I wasn't asking her, I told her. She, <laughs> I said, God just told me. My wife happened to be born on the, on the same date that my mother died, first of May. <laughs> All you guys that think you are sharp, that you are using your own eye. Eh? To uh, be running around and eh, eh, eh? listen to this, you need angelic help. That's why I have a good wife. The Bible talks about the angel of God spoke to me in a dream. Jacob and I and said, Jacob, here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes now. Listen to this. When you are stranded and they are trying to treat you at work, the invisible coat will activate angels to come and give you a strategy out. Angelic help. Hallelujah. Number three, provision. I guess for sake of time, I will leave this alone. But, I, I, you know, all I will say is, listen to this, my life has been that. I, I left medicine, listen to this, you know, to the whatever of everybody else. You shall not left medicine to do t-shirts. <laughs> I came out wealthier than all of them. And then God told me, drop everything. And live for England. I just took, sold my car, got 1,000 pounds, said I would go and use it to buy a car there. They now asked me to go and start a church. As soon as I started, they gave me 200 pounds and, and six people, 250 pounds. Long story short, I mean, I leave that as a story for another day. I mean, how do you start a church with 250 pounds and six people? By the invisible help of God. <laughs> By the time I was leaving that church, that church's turnover was almost two million pounds a year. And then God told me, again, he spoke to me in San Francisco, leave all of these things and walk out of here and go and start where I will tell you again. And I In fact, one pastor friend <laughs> told me that I said, <laughs> this one where you leave that church. I said, that same church where you get people like this. He said it in, in broken. He said, where you did TV, where this are, without building. He said, me, I don't go here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and he was being honest. But I have proven God over the years. I started that church, listen to this, with no money. I had to borrow 2,000 pounds from my, from my business. About within the first, a few people just started calling me. People unexpected. I hadn't spoken with, oh, take this, take so much. Take. That was even with We, by the grace of God, I left that church after planting it for 20 years, pastoring it. This church, 
we, in less than two years, we reached, we surpassed the numbers we were there. And then our income was more than what we ever had there. The invisible code. The invisible code. Number Z4, the covenant of protection. When you wear this coat, listen to this, <laughs> you will be protected. You know, when people will be, ah, this, hey, 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 confessing. Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is essentially that, say, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, under the coat of the Almighty. It says in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4 to 6, and the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a knack on the foreheads of the men who sigh, and to the others, he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city, kill, do not let any, let your eyes spare, but do not come near anyone whom is what? The mark. This scripture shows that in heaven there are some people that are marked. And there's something about an invisible coat that when they look through what's bed, then they, they say, well, who is wearing this coat? And then they spare these people. For sake of time, I will, you know, I, I will leave. If you look at Genesis 20, verse 7, you see that Abimelech and uh, uh, Pharaoh took uh, Abraham's wife. God goes and warns them in a dream. Hey, be careful, my friend. Restore that man's wife. He's a prophet and he will pray for you and you shall live. If you do not restore, know that you shall surely die. That is the power of the invisible wealth. When God fights your battle. That is why Israel could fight a war against see, five or six nations and defeat them in six days. That's the shortest war in the... It perplexes the whole world. But when we talk about protection, listen to this, that protection is not just for you, it's also for your children. This, my same son, in this same school, he had an exam. I think it was his final exam. And while he was sitting the final exams, I slept and I had a dream. And I saw him writing some things on his hand before he entered an exam. Hall. <laughs> but it was strange because the final exam was in Bible knowledge and you see, I mean, pastor son, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, so why will he be cheating? So I couldn't get to him in time for, before the exam, but you know, so he had already gotten it. When he came back home after the exams, I said, Tony, you know God shows me things though. He said, hey, dad. I said, I'm confused. Because you are the best in your class in so so and so. I said, I saw you writing on your left hand. He said, Daddy, that, 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 God showed you that. that. God showed you that. I said, What do you mean? He said, It didn't happen like that, really. Let me tell you what happened. That, let me tell you what happened. There's the son. You see, that's called a lot of wealthy kids go there. The sons of. The like of Abramovich, a, a Russian oligarch, a Russian billionaire, was a classmate and his friend. And he came to him and said, you are the best student in this thing. I don't know this subject at all. Can you write some things so that I can take it into the hall? He said, no, I can't do that. Then he said to him, he said, okay, will you at least give me your notes so I can study? Unbeknownst to my son, he took my son's notes and was, he wrote the answers on the back of his hand and went into the hall and they caught him. He had enticed my son because there was a match, you know, um, uh, one of the, those final matches and said, look, if you give me this also, that I will fly you in the private jet after whatever, you and I will go and we'll go and watch that match. He said, uh -huh, if my dad catches me, <laughs> so now what am I trying to say here listen to this my son said he said dad I'm afraid if God could show you that kind of thing he said this is serious time will just not permit me but in my last two minutes I just want to say to you that listen to this 
There is clearly something that God wants us to desire. And it is not things. When you look at the scripture in Genesis 26, I would have thought that the thing that the people would be contending with are what we see in Genesis 26, 14. It says, for he had possessions. This is Isaac. The Bible says, and Isaac sowed in the land, and he reaped in the same year, what? A hundredfold. And he had what? He, he says he began to prosper, continued prospering, and became very prosperous. Then he said he had possessions of what? Cattle, herds, bees, and servants. You and I know that if somebody wants to attack somebody's wealth, what would they attack? What would they collect? I will collect the cars and the money. Yeah. But you know what? The Bible says that was not what the enemy went for. They went to go and stop the wells. Verse 15. Now, the Philistines that stopped all the wells which his father, the, you know, so so and so dug. The enemy will always aim to take and stop what you have. But Satan's biggest strategy is to attack your source and not your resource. Did you get that? Yes, sir. Satan is wiser than you think that it is that they stole your car. You are crying. Forget that. That's the resource. For uh, they stole your money. You are crying. That's the resource. What you should be crying over when they steal is that they stole your prayer time. Never let your activity overwhelm your spirituality. I end with this thought. You see, I keep saying dreams, dreams. Dreams is not the only way God speaks. In fact, in my life, that's the, the, the least, you know. I had this particular dream where I saw a principality come and I was on the lap, my laptop and I was working on it and he kept trying to distract me and collect my laptop. His aim was to take my laptop away from me and I kept kept resisting him, kept resisting. Then, all of a sudden, I noticed that as I was, I was working, the guy got angry. And what did he do? He just went to the, what, the power source and pulled it out. And as I was working, and he just, he just started to laugh. What he was trying to say is, if I cannot get your source, I will disconnect you from the power source. And that's what the enemy has been trying to do to a lot of us. Listen to this. God is your source. If you lose your resource and you have God, you will gain much more back. But if you lose your God, you will have lost everything. Let's stand up as we pray.